Tell me when you're live and then I'll switch. You're good. Good evening, church. Welcome. Uh, having some technical issues again tonight. Only this time it's with computers and televisions. And so here we are. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer. God our Father, our thanks and our praise be to you that we have this opportunity to study together, to come together and worship, to study from your word. Teach us, Lord, as we begin this service. We're running late. We know it. We have technology issues. We pray that you would deliver us from these things. It's, it's a strange thing when technology doesn't work, but it's a stranger thing when computer programs that were working five minutes earlier won't work at the time the church starts. Lord, we ask that your intervention would come and that you would be with us this night as we study together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Gonna be scrolling down here to get to the message part. So we're studying the rich man and Lazarus from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. I'm gonna read that passage for you tonight. And now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores. And longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table, besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, and being in torment, and Abraham saw far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that no one may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I be beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Jesus is presenting to us what's called an upside-down kingdom. Quite literally, it's the reverse of the way the world works. We think if you have power and you have money and you have position and you have authority, you have everything. But that's not the way it works in Jesus' kingdom. In Jesus' kingdom, the meek are awarded and rewarded. And, and the fact is, in, in this passage, that Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies. That's, that's exactly the opposite of what the world teaches. It's upside down from what the world teaches. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, 29, store up treasures for, in heaven, not treasures here on earth. And he adds to that where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break in and steal. And in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus said, enter the small gate and walk the narrow path. Not the broad path of the world, not the, not the wild ways of, of humankind, but rather 
to walk the narrow path of God's word. And so, in other words, the kingdom of God is the opposite of the way that the world works. But this upside-down kingdom kind of gets a bit touchy when Jesus talks about being rich and, and in a worldly sense. You see, the disciples all became upset with him, and it tells us in my and Matthew's gospel, it, where it tells this same parable, that, that they said, who then can be saved? Hmm. And, and Jesus, uh, you know, addressed this issue of wealth and, and how prosperity and desire for worldly things poisons the mind against the things of God. And, and quite literally, quite literally, the teachings on, of Jesus on money came as a direct result of Jesus talking directly to people about their hard attitudes and about what money does. In, in Jesus' world, the apostles and everybody else believed that if you had money, if you had position, if you had power, it was because you were really holy and God blessed you. And there must be something wrong with the rest of us that are living in poverty. That's, that's not what Jesus understood. That's not what Jesus taught. It's not what the Bible teaches. You see, Jesus, the disciples, they were upset by these statements in Matthew 13 about the influence of wealth on a person's spiritual condition. And, and if, if the rich can't be saved, who then can be saved? And Jesus threw out this whole attitude that, well, you know, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. A camel in an eye of a needle? That's, that's an incredible comparison. It's, it's not physically possible. You don't see the rich man in this passage dressed in secondhand clothes or discount store specials. Uh, it says very clearly, the rich man was habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. Now, fine linen, you know, re most people wore kind of a rough woven cloth that was homespun and, and thick and, and ragged looking, and uh, there were lumps in those threads. No, fine linen was, was woven on, a, on an excellent professional weaver's loom, and it was woven with really fine spun threads, with threads that were were micro thin and, and made for smooth, nice clothing on your body. And how about that purple stuff? It came from Macedonia, you know? Uh, there was a seashell that they boiled down and they got the ink out of the seashell and they used it to make purple cloth, but it was so expensive to make and so expensive to ship and so expensive to buy that only the very rich wore purple. So he's walking around in nice, nice clothes, you know, good stuff. And he's walking around in purple so that the world knows that he has money. And, and he's living with splendor every day. But Lazarus, and here's the contrast, Lazarus was a poor man. He was lame. He was laid, literally, somebody put him at that rich man's gate, hoping that the rich man would be able to care for him and feed him. And the rich man, of course, ignored him. He knew he was there, obviously, but he didn't, uh, didn't provide for him food, didn't provide for him care. And, and Lazarus laid at the gate with open, oozing sores. And when Lazarus was in all of that agony and all of that pain, he hoped, he wished just to have some of the crumbs off the rich man's table. Just some of those crumbs would be wonderful. And he didn't get them. And besides that, he had dogs to take care of his wounds. The dogs came up and they licked his sores and they licked his wounds and they felt him out and, and helped him uh, in some ways, at least to continue to live. But then both died. But let's back up for just a second. Let's talk a little bit about this world. You see, th there was Lazarus, who was all of the pain and all of the agony, all of the contrast. 
But Jesus is presenting here a huge contrast. The rich man dressed in purple and fine linen. Lazarus covered in sores. Longs for crumbs to eat. Has dogs licking his wounds. What a, what a world apart. But let's bring that forward to today. You know, in, in the month of April, there were all kinds of people standing in line, literally in their cars. The, the lines were five miles long in most major cities and had at least 1,500 cars waiting to pick up food at a food bank. And that was true. It was true all over the United States in all the major cities. And at that time, at that time, they did a news broadcast where a very rich, very powerful politician showed off her $20 million home and all of its fine trimmings and stood in front of her two $20,000 refrigerators, yeah, 20,000, I think a 1,000 or 2,000 is a lot for a refrigerator, but she had $20,000 refrigerators, and she had two of them, and she pulled the drawer open, and the drawer was totally full of gourmet chocolate ice cream, yeah, and all these people that are sitting in line in the cars, the, there was no compassion for them. She had her refinements. She had her nice house. She had her nice refrigerator. She had all of her gourmet chocolate ice cream. But, you know, those people, they can just sit in line and they can get whatever they can get there that day. They needed bread. They needed milk. They needed flour. They needed canned goods. They needed food to feed themselves and to feed their children. But she had gourmet ice cream in $20,000 refrigerators. Yeah. But before you get sore about Nancy Pelosi, remember the point that Jesus made. You see, wealth blinds our eyes to truth. And that's what happened to this rich man. His eyes were blinded to truth. He couldn't see the truth. And so there's an epitaph in here, and the rich man... Uh, this whole upside down kingdom thing came to play very clearly in in this passage because the poor man it says died and he was carried away by angels to Abraham's bosom. Wow, man, that's that's quite a treat. I mean, he, this guy's laying there with rags on. He's laying there with sores that are being licked by a dog. He's laying there just hoping for a crumb to fall from the table of the rich man that he might be given. But suddenly he passed away, and when he passed away, he was carried away with by the angels, literally to heaven, to, to what they called Abraham's bosom was heaven, was the place of the righteous dead. But the rich man, it says, died and was buried. What an epitaph, what a... Look at look at the miles apart of those of those two contrasts. First the contrast between the rich and the poor, then the contrast between how the righteous is carried away to God in the power of the angels and how the unrighteous they're buried, they're dead and they go to hell. That's that's what is being revealed in this passage. You see here's the rich man, he's in hell. And he looks up and he sees in the distance that Lazarus is out there. That Lazarus is all relaxed and reposed, being treated nicely in Abraham's bosom in heaven. And here he is in the fire of hell, and he is being tormented. And he is in agony. And he cried out to Abraham and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Have Lazarus come over and dip his finger in the water and cool off my tongue because I am in agony in this flame. What a description of hell. Is that place you want to go? I would think not. But there are people that are on their way there because they won't hear the truth. And so, here's the rich man. And he's burning in the flames of hell. He's in torment and he still hasn't got the point. 
The whole upside down kingdom idea came down to play on him, but he still hasn't got the point because the response of Abraham brushed up against cold, hard reality. You make your choices in this world, and you either submit yourself to God and believe in Jesus Christ and his righteousness, and you come to salvation in this world, or in the next world you pay the penalty of your sins. And his wealth had blinded him to the needs of the people around him, had, had comfort and luxury every day of his life, but saw no reason for himself to help anybody else in need. Uh, it's too bad you have to sit in that line of 1,500 cars that's five miles long and wait and hope that they have some food left when you get there. But I have my $20,000 refrigerators that are full of gourmet ice cream. It's, it's the same. It's the same attitude, you see. It's the same attitude. In Hades, the man was in torment. In Hades, the man was paying the penalty of a life choice that he made while he was alive. And we have to make that choice too. The hard reality is if we don't, the agony of hell will not burn out of us our attitude of heart. And it didn't burn out of his heart, his attitudes either. You see, that wrong and hurtful attitude of the rich man, he still sees Lazarus as his slave, as, as a person who should serve him. He's subservient. He's a pauper. He's a nobody. He, he isn't anybody important at all. And so I only, I only deal with important people. And so Lazarus, he's over there having a good life with Abraham in heaven. And you just send him on over. Let him dip his fingers in cold water. Let him cool off my tongue for me. And Abraham says, uh-uh. You had your good things in this life. He had bad things. Now he has good things in eternal life. And you have bad to things for the rest of eternity. Wow, that's that's pretty harsh reality. And so Abraham gave this guy the cold shoulder and just straight up told him it can't be done. If a person will not believe the Bible when they are alive, and they, then they're not going to believe when someone comes rising from the dead. And that's where this goes next, because the, the rich man then said, well, okay, okay. Since, since there's a gulf fixed between us and you can't send Lazarus over and I can't go over there, then, then let's, let's work this out. You know, send Lazarus back to my family. Bring him back to life. Send him back from the dead. Send him to my brothers. I've got five of them and I don't want them to come here. And that's when Abraham said they have the Bible. That's what he means when he says they have Moses and the prophets. They literally have the teachings of Moses, the law of God. They literally have the message from all the prophets scolding the people who mistreated others and seeing all of the examples of bad kings and all of the examples of good kings and all of the wise words of David in Scripture. All of that, all of that is there. It's all there. But these people can't see it. They won't listen to it while they're alive in this world. So sending somebody back to them from the dead isn't going to change them either. In other words, when people can't believe in Jesus, can't believe that he's God in the flesh, can't believe that he rose from the dead and that he, that he lives today yet because he took the power of life back to himself, it's because they don't believe the word to start with. They don't believe the Bible. They don't believe this book. And they aren't living by that book. We, we have, and I see it every day, what I call a sweet tea Christian. They say they're a Christian. They go to church maybe. Maybe they go through all the rituals of life. They've been baptized. They go to communion, etc., etc., etc. But they really don't live by what God taught. They don't take the word to heart. They don't live upside down to the world, but rather they use the world to serve them. And so they're okay They're okay being a Christian as long as everything's sweet, pleasant, and nice, like a, like a glass of sweet tea. 
but they're not okay when that teaching of Jesus comes up against the reality of their everyday life. And then they're in trouble. In simple terms, it's time to repent. Time to turn away from our love of this world and seek the heart of God. Now, now wait a minute, you know, I don't count myself as rich by any means. I have a nice home. Uh, thank you very much to the aunt that died and left us the money to put a down payment on it. Um, I have food on the table. I have food in the freezer. I have canned goods on the shelf. I have flour on the shelf. I can, I can make my dinner and I can eat it and I can enjoy it. But there are people that walk five miles just to find firewood. Or walk five miles just to find water and it's dirty water. It's not clean water. It's dirty water. It's contaminated water. And it's the best that they can do. And certainly they are poor. And certainly I need to have an attitude of kindness and love for them. I was sitting in traffic several years ago. There were two lanes beside me on the right and two lanes beside me on the left. A right-hand turn lane, a left-hand turn lane, and three lanes of, of through traffic. And I looked over to the right, and I'm sitting at this light. It's a very long light because it's six lanes of traffic crossing each other on, on both sides of the road. And, and here sat a woman and a girl on a park bench, or a bus bench, rather. And they were sitting there, and there was a box of clothes between them. And the girl looked about 16, stood up, and pulled something out of the box, and walked around behind the bench, and she pulled on a skirt, and pulled off her jeans, and then reached over into the box, and pulled out a pair of panties, and she slipped her dirty ones off, and put clean ones on, washed her face with a, with a wet wipe, with a Clorox wipe, and washed her arms and her hands with that wipe, combed her hair, and looked at her face in a mirror, and went and stood and waited for the school bus that was back up the road, another 10 or 15 cars. Wow. There was absolutely nothing I could do to get to them. I wondered if they even had breakfast that day. But here they are on a park bench with everything they have between them in a box, and she's dressing and washing for school in public. You see, the heart attitude of compassion shows that we really, truly know Jesus. The rich man didn't know the power of God. Let's pray. God, our Father, our thanks and our praise to you. We rejoice in you. We, we give praise to you for your goodness and your kindness and your love. Help us, Lord, to turn our hearts in, in love and generosity toward others and to follow you and your teachings. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.